OSI. I was a special agent with Air Force OSI. I and then was an, the FBI as yeah, well. I was, I was an operational employee for the FBI. I did spooky stuff for the FBI, but they get real particular about their titles. Actually, oh. an investigator for the Air Force, that uh, could be, if you're a lot, not under NDA or can mention a little bit, uh, compared with the FBI, you said you did a little spooky stuff there. Which one was more spookier? Uh, more intensive things that you covered? Oh, the Air Force. Um, and that's in the realm of um, technology, of course. Um, as, with the FBI, it was pretty much um, working against the uh, KGB and the GRU um, and occasionally the Chinese service. But um, once I got into the Air Force, that involved technology. Well, and that's uh, what we're all about, especially with APEC, Alternative Propulsion Engineering Conference that uh, Jeremy is a co-founder of, that uh, I'm a co-host of, and that the philosophy is disclosure through technology and bringing this technology out. And uh, it, it's long overdue, and we should actually get you in touch with Tim Venture to have an APEC presentation uh, on specifically what you covered with the Air Force, as we do have a lot of uh, former military people and uh, industry um, engineers and scientists that working and doing presentations with APEC. Wow. It's what it's all about. So, okay. well, you um, help, Walter right? was nice enough to send me a copy of his book. I don't know if you've read his book, but Walter's dad was in the Air Force too and, and actually mm -hmm. worked at the Aero Med Lab at Wright. Uh, right, Patterson Air Force Base, and and uh, and testified on his deathbed about about seeing bodies. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some really? Yeah. Um, now, in in my line of work, it was mostly program <laughs> protection, but you had to be briefed in to the level of what you were protecting, obviously. So that was my initial exposure to Air Force technology, and then when I was at Wright Patterson home of the Air Force Labs and all the other interesting spooky things. Um, I was in, uh, I was chief of double agent operations branch and that deals with technology. Um, I can't go too far into it, but you're dealing with technology. You're just looking at it every day, thousands of pages. Um, basically I was assigned to the detachment at Wright Pat but I took my mission um, orders from OSI headquarters and, and the Pentagon was involved in that. So, you know, I would basically tell my commander at Wright Pat what my branch was doing as opposed to him telling us what to do unless... One of the rare cases in like government and bureaucracy where it's like you're more powerful or more in control of your job than the higher ups or what, or what you're in, in, in that particular case, uh, my supervisory immediate supervisory authority was a Lieutenant Colonel. And I was, uh, started out there as a first Lieutenant and made captain while I was there. And it, you know, but basically it, it really is. You're just informing him, sir, this is what we're up to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he, he, if we had, um, and we did have this happen, if we had a spy situation pop up, a suspected spy or whatever, then we were in charge of counter espionage investigations as well as operations. So, right. So that um, would be the reason why, and the depart or the, yeah, departmentalization because to prevent moles and spies of yeah. why, like, you are informing your higher ups and like you're in charge of the information yeah. and, keep it very classified right right and also that that serves to help in um certain field situations particularly during wartime if you get captured and you're tortured you don't know the whole story they can only get the one piece out of you um that that's a part of compartmentalization they don't like to talk about so much <laughs> and so one the big issue that came out of all of this that's like hindering humanity is the counterintelligence sort of operation and like the oh like to prevent like the Russians or the communists or whoever to get hold of uh, something that's real, that's like a risk of national security or whatever, that 
the people investigating it would actually like put out debunking stuff and make the population believe it's not true as this counterintelligence. So mm -hmm. then like the scientific community is like, hey, our authoritarian like uh, uh, academic or agencies are saying that this is false. So like this is bunk science when in yeah. fact, like these could be the advancements that are holding back and like the next leap of like, technology and advancement yeah right? like, like it's also easier to let people believe it's something from another world and that way you you kind of protect it when it's your own technology so there it, it depends on the situation sometimes you encourage people to think the otherworldly because you don't want them to know how real world it is so, so in regards to that and in your time at the Air Force and the whole Nimitz encounters, are you suggesting or would you say that you've experienced the possibility that the Tic Tacs are actually maybe like the Air Forces or like the Pentagons or like the CIA or some like American technology, but then the Navy has no idea or like uh, no knowledge of it and are led to believe that it's off-worldly no. or out extra dimensional or something like that from the get-go i read that as our technology and it's not that the navy doesn't know it's that the brave and courageous squadron commander fravor wasn't briefed in on it okay um the the, the spin that has been put on that tic tac thing um you know when i when i see a squadron commander say stuff like you know um if i wasn't briefed in on it or if i didn't know it it wasn't ours i i just that is so laughable and i i would give him credit if i ran into him he's having a beer somewhere i'd walk up to him and laugh and i'd say commander come on you know better than to say crap like that and i would venture to say he'd probably wink and uh, agree because uh, you know when you're when when advanced technology is being still tested you know is in that test and development phase i'm sorry um every squadron commander is not briefed in on it and um in my opinion what that was was um a test they wanted a live field test uh with with real human reaction to this advanced technology okay now remember the um the sorties were People, I got in arguments with people who said they wouldn't do that right over the city of San Diego. Well, they didn't do it right over the city of San Diego. It was miles out to sea and it was at a latitude that was well south of San Diego. It was more even with Baja, California, and it was in a very, an absolutely known U.S. Navy technology test area. I was going to say, isn't there like a U.S. sub base or like special and all, military? And all of that or... too, but a known specific technology test zone. And they were on a routine um, proficiency sortie also, you know, getting their flying time in. Those planes were not armed, okay? So when you want a real-world reaction to something extraordinary, you're going to throw that at your personnel under those circumstances where no, no destruction can be wrought, no one can be hurt, so that you can get a real human reaction. Now, let's not forget that there were witnesses on those ships that also said, two air force guys that they referred to as intelligence officers showed up on board and confiscated the um the modules from the you know the consoles or whatever from the the yes uh, uh, radar kevin stuff. day kevin day um he was the radar operator of either on the nimitz or on the aegeus destroyer uh, and he was did an apec uh, conference presentation he he testified and stated to that and like how ticked off they were about that and how quickly that happened and like literally yeah. like he said black hawk helicopters like with people in black suits came and landed within like 15 minutes and like took it like while he had like gone to the bathroom sure. or something and came back yeah. and it was gone and he was like and, just and ticked. i i guarantee you at least the flag level commander of that whatever it was it was out to sea um, I, I'm sorry, I forget my naval terms, flotilla or fleet or whatever, whatever part of it was. That. I guarantee you at least the flag level officer the was brief. The carrier strike group. Fight. The carrier strike group. Yeah, I guarantee you that, that there were some high level officers that were told the labs are going to be doing something and we're going to be throwing it at your guys. So, believe me. And, and besides, the commander of that vessel that the Air Force guys showed up to take stuff, there's no way that commander is just going to allow 
these unknown guys to show up and take anything off of his vessel. Right. And, and like, once so again, the compartmentalization the and how you stated, like, in case of yeah. like a capture or torture or whatever, why you don't inform every single person of every single yeah. detail. You right. want to give the least amount of information possible yeah. to the least amount of actors to keep it see, like protected. And, and here's here, here's the thing I want to point out, because I was one of them from the get go. When I heard this story, when it broke publicly. There were a few of us that said, guys, this is our technology. Just stop it with all this nonsense. And sure enough, as time went on with, with those patents that were released that were identical to the things reported, and with time, the more people thought about it, and when the story got out about them retrieving the, you know, this, the stuff, the data, I, I think people began to realize, oh, uh, yeah, that was likely our technology. And um, the, the, the thing is... They also, whatever spin, whatever perception management spin they were doing for the public, because remember this, this happened in what, 2004, right? And they're not talking about it till years later. That's perception management. That's put out there for uh, a reason. And uh, they got their... I, I got to add into for. that, it, that per, in the perception management of it, and wasn't it, uh, it was either Jeremy Corbell or Lou Elizondo that was like, the supposed hero and spearhead that was able to bring it to the public. And that was like the one that brought like the hero yeah. that like made it to be able to be declassified to the public or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, like, Jeremy Corbell's the head of something. It ain't a spear. Um, <laughs> you know, the carnival barker. I, yeah, he has no credibility with me. More um, and none uh, of us in this, in this, yeah. This, um, and, and Lou Elizondo so, uh, was doing his perception management operation job. I've said that from the beginning, too. Got a lot of grief for he's that. He's like an actual prime yeah. example of this counter espionage, like, uh, operation yeah. like management like director yeah. like that that is the position that is the job perception and he management really is yeah. hired or has the uh job history that he works yeah. that government position going into this role so it's like that's what he's been trained for that's what yeah. he's like literally been working his entire career as like is this freaking yeah to play a character of this uh, propaganda I, I, espionage. And I think Fravor too, in the same way, is is just being a good, you know, um uh aviator, naval aviator, you know, good soldier, yeah. as we say. Rush is a boy yeah. scout too. And right? he was mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. Rush, that's you know, <laughs> um I just gotta report on what I saw and what people were telling me, you know, like yeah. So the one thing like I, I really would love to get know, Kevin man. Day it's back a... for a second interview because he it, he it it just he moved me in like believe like believing his genuine experience of what he stated there and that he believed that he experienced like a almost telekinetic or connection or like some sort of um like act yeah like essentially a conscious connect with the operator of the tic tac and that at one point and like stated that he believed that it was like off-worldly or coming or something and like that he genuinely went through that but then to for the count counter or another possibility and uh, going into eric hecker from uh that i've interviewed several times and we just did a recent one he's the whistleblower mm -hmm. from antarctica that worked mm -hmm. with raytheon for a year down there and that mm -hmm. he's putting forth evidence and claims that uh, they have these facilities and technology for implanting thoughts and direct into the brain um, yeah. experiences yeah. so could that also have been part of the overall op if it was like a, you know, a test si um, false play or whatever the heck sort of thing like a american project that simultaneously they made the, certainly possible uh, I, I would love to see right? more evidence for that uh you know well, the, 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 figured the, out the microwave auditory effect in in the lab so he can actually demonstrate that with the voiceover voice of god well, technology and, where they yeah can, voice of god dates back to what 62 yeah 60, and that's yeah. real but i as Delgado, far as right? As far as I, I just bring that up because he like Kevin Day so genuinely believes like the way you can just see like he was like shook to his core and like has forever changed his life, his perspective. And, you know, just 
his life being journey that like he experienced something otherworldly with that whole encounter and whatnot. Yeah, so advanced like, technology can do that to you. Yeah, right. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like it, he, his experience was that they were projecting that it was off world, but it could also be that it was American technology, both yeah. testing it as well as projecting into oh, it the, was American technology. Into the things to believe it was UFO. And that could be for a potential uh, yeah. larger scale false flag of this fake alien invasion that they. Can yeah, exactly. Because right? there, there is every reason to believe that it was that it's American technology. Um, so, uh, uh, absolutely it speaks to the false flag alien invasion idea. It, it certainly, because, you know, now, as far as technology goes, you, 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 uh, also were researching this Delishaw group and the Sonoro Aero club, uh, Walter, and, and you talked yeah. about that in your book as well. Um, have you made any progress with uh, your investigations into um, any of that? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, during the weekend of the NIMSICON, um, I learned um, I learned um, something about Tuolumne County that I didn't know before because Malia Grimm, my associate, um, said, Hey, let's go, let's, let's drive in there a different route. So the route we went revealed an abundance of a particular mineral in the area, um, known as mariposite. And, um, you know, we thought, Hey, wait a minute, this stuff is green and talking with Olaf Phillips, he agreed. And all three of us came to the conclusion that, um, Peter Menace, who was the leader of the Sonora Era Club in the 1850s. Well, Charles Delshaw, our source of the Sonora Era Club, writes that the, the, the fuel, so to speak, um, the ingredient run through the turbine of these flying arrows, um, was this stuff that the leader, Peter Menace, referred to as the soup. And it was green. Delshaw himself saw it. He described it as green. There was this secret element to which Menace just simply added water and then ran through their their turbine which uh, i have said is a racine turbine virtually it's identical um which the racine turbine was published in 1850 now uh some years back a couple years ago i thought well i wonder if it could be liquefied emerald and i talked about this with joseph farrell threw it past him and he said i think you're onto something but i don't know if emerald would fit well as i learned last weekend mariposite is in abundance right there in Tuolumne County. Hmm. And it's green, and it has some interesting properties, which Jeremy can describe a lot better than I can. And Malia described them to me because she knows something about uh, geology that's a lot more than I do. And uh, my conclusion, our conclusion, you know, we all three agreed, me and Malia and Olaf, was that the secret ingredient in soup was powderized mariposite which then was liquefied with water. And when you run that through this Racine turbine design, I think it's very likely you'll get, um, you'll get something that uh, might it's... contribute, you know, to anti-gravity flight. I don't know. <laughs> and well, it says, it says... Sorry, the mariposite we were just briefly talking before we went live has mica. The main thing is mica, and mica yeah. is a dielectric. And that uh, we're going to have to bring this up to Bob Greenier of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Is he's uh, uh, we'll have to have someone go out there to that particular town and get us a local sample too, yeah. so that we For can sure. throw it under SEM and do some other tests on the local um, source of that stuff to see if there's anything else in there or anything special about the, those structures and that that are well because the mic is a dielectric and in, in a powder like a lick a crystallized nano powder and then you, when, if you have it in a liquid and if you can get it charged and ionized enough and into a plasma essentially you have these you'd have a liquid crystal uh like nano superconducting plasma that could be that's dielectric hmm. in structure and nature uh off the get-go and that could be an insulator or like an outer 
you know, if you're having two liquids like a mercury on the inside and then you have that uh, the, the mica powder 